Welcome to Corwin's Teacher to Teacher podcast with host Carol Pelletier Radford. Carol is an experienced classroom teacher, university educator, founder of mentoringinaction.com, and author of four best selling professional books for teachers. She believes the best form of professional learning happens when teachers engage in authentic conversations and share their wisdom. In every episode, Carol and her guests share stories about pivotal moments in their careers, successful classroom strategies, and personal actions they take to minimize stress and stay healthy. The Teacher to Teacher podcast is a place to engage in authentic conversation and reflection with experienced educators. We hope these conversations will energize you, keep you inspired, and remind you why you chose to become a teacher. Hello, welcome to the Teacher to Teacher podcast, sharing our wisdom with our host, Carol Radford. I am Tori Bachman, a Corwin editor and co-producer of this podcast, which we've created for teachers at all levels who are searching for practical wisdom they can use in their classrooms. We believe we're all constantly learning and we're learning together. This episode is a bit special because we have three educators joining us today to share their wisdom. And I am happy to introduce our guests to you now, we have Kayla Brasenio, Stephen Brasenio, and Nicole Foranash. Um, Kayla Brasenio has taught English all over the world and to nearly every age, from elementary through adults, and currently teaches sixth and seventh grade ELA and creative writing. Stephen Brasenio is a Mexican American author, a middle school English teacher, and a teacher developer. His debut picture book, The Notebook Keeper A Story of Kindness from the Border, received a Pora Bill Prey honor. Kayla and Stephen are both self-declared book nerds, coffee lovers, and national park fanatics. They lead professional development workshops with Gretchen Bernabe, and they live in San Antonio with their daughter Zinnia. Stephen and Kayla recently published their first professional book along with Gretchen Bernabe, titled Text Structures from Picture Books, Lessons to Ease Students into Text Analysis, Reading Response, and Writing with Craft. Kayla and Steven, it's so nice to see you. Welcome to Teacher to Teacher today. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Yes. And Nicole Foranash is joining us. Nicole is a special education resource teacher in grades kindergarten to fifth, and she's been teaching for 10 years. Nicole is the lead EC teacher in her school, supporting teachers with their needs, teaching exceptional children. And Nicole serves as a mentor teacher. She lives in Burgon, North Carolina with her husband, daughter, her dog, and a pet goat. Nicole is also one of the teachers featured in Carol's recent book, When I Started Teaching, I Wish I Had Known, Weekly Wisdom for Beginning Teachers. Hey, Nicole. Thanks for making time with us today. Hey, thank you. It's great to be here. So we've all been looking forward to getting to know one another and talking with Carol and we appreciate the time that you're taking with us. Thank you for being here. I'll turn this over to Carol now. Thanks, Tori, and welcome. So we have a husband and wife author team. I'm very curious to he hear how that works out. So Kayla and Steven, welcome. And Nicole, um, uh, we have met once or twice, so I'm happy to uh, see you again on this. Yes, nice to see you again. <laughs> and, and have you join us. What I love about Teacher to Teacher is the purpose of this conversation is for our listeners, whether they're beginners or experienced teachers, to take away some practical ideas that they can infuse into their daily practice. So I want to just dive right in. I'm going to start with Kayla and Steven. Just tell me what what you're teaching right now. Where are you uh, right now, and uh, how this is all leading to you being authors, <laughs> Kayla? Well, we are both sixth grade English teachers. Um, we we normally teach at the same school, but this the last two years we have moved to different yes. schools. Um, and so I teach sixth grade English, um, and seventh grade creative writing. And I teach sixth and seventh grade English and drama. Yes. Oh, fun. So, so do you work together at home? How does this work out? You drive to school together, drop off. So how, how is that we working? We used to, but not anymore. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I used to buy a second, we had to buy a second car because we're not oh. car. <laughs> <laughs> that influenced you and 
Um, Nicole, what about you? What, what, tell me a little more about what you're doing right now. So I work in the special education department at my school. It's a Title I school, so we work with a lot of low-income students. Um, so our demographic is a lot different than the rest of the county. We do live in a large county, um, and we are pretty much in the country on my side where I live. And it's a rural place, and you do some mentoring. So you have a mentor, a mentee right now? Yes, I actually have two mentees right now. Um, one is a third year beginner teacher. So this is her last year with a mentor. And my other one is a second year beginning teacher. And she is really striving to do great things this year, which is awesome to see. I love that. So I like to ask my guests uh, as part of the launch of each episode uh, to share a pivotal moment in their career that uh, where they made a decision or found some wisdom in some experience that happened to them that made them decide to, like you, be a mentor. Uh, I'm just interested in how teachers make decisions and choices. So, Nicole, you want to share? A so for me, when I, sure, when I first started, I had a mentor that um, wasn't really invested um, in teaching me or guiding me in the way a mentor should. So a lot of the information my first year teaching, I had to find on my own. I had to figure things out and I didn't want that for new teachers. I feel like new teachers really need that support for them throughout the school. That way they don't feel like they're failing because we don't want any teachers to feel like they're failing. And we're losing teachers. Uh a lot at a high rate at a high rate in, across the country because of the challenges that teachers face and the issues that our students have so you actually ch were you're choosing to be a mentor because you didn't have a mentor correct <laughs> you do it on your own what why do you think the the mentor what was missing in that mentor or that where you did your student teaching or beginning teacher why do you think the mentor wasn't able to do that? I think almost they lost their passion for teaching. Okay. okay. They were in it, you know, it was more routine at that point. All right. And for me, it's something I love doing. And I think they just reached that point in their career where they didn't love it anymore. Right. So you're very mindful then of what not to do because- yes. That your experience uh, was not as positive as you're trying to make it for the mentors and and the other beginning teachers at your school. So thanks Correct. for helping that. All right, Kayla and Stephen, pivotal moment where wisdom, like the aha, this happened in your life, your career changes. What what shows up for you? When I think about it, I think about think back to kind of the earlier days of teaching where I was um, one of two ESL teachers at our, our campus and I looped with my students. I had sixth, seventh and eighth graders in the same class. And um, it was after my first year with the students, I just attended a professional development with Gretchen Burnaby. Um, and um, it was just a kind of, oh, we got to fill our hours kind of thing. I didn't expect a lot from it. And she put us in the student seat and asked us to write, asked us to share our writing and be vulnerable and try things. And I left there just like a sponge that was not just full, but like dripping with just excitement to be, a, to have been a learner and a writer. I left feeling like a writer. And I, and I knew that I wanted to give my students this, that same feeling when they came into my classroom. And so I went home and I read her entire book, Crunch Time, in a weekend, which I'm a slow reader or I used to be. Um, and I inhaled it. And I've never done that with a professional book in my life. That, that does speak to what her stuff is about, but also the way she writes books or just she thinks about teachers um, so well, like that we don't have a ton of time to slog through a bunch of pedagogy. Like she's like, here is what you need today. And here wow. you go. Nice. Wow. Love that. What a testimony to her, her 
uh, professional learning style with adults and yes. putting you in the student seat. I love that. So what's the first thing that you did in action in your classroom after having that epiphany that, well, I'm going to change my teaching style. What, right. what do you remember doing? Yeah, uh, it definitely turned my teaching style on its head. I remember day, day one of, of class with when I had a lot of the same students in the room, I told them, you know what? The way I taught you writing last year was trash. And I'm so sorry. I am, I, you know, like, but I learned some cool new things and I cannot wait to try them with you. And well, what's one of them? Tell me one. I mean, one, one of them is, is called a kernel essay. And okay. I say is really just if you think of a kernel of corn, it's nice and small and it's something that you can keep the same or expand or whatever. Okay. So if you like she taught us the memory structure and you follow a text structure. So you answer just you answer questions with one sentence each. So the memory structure starts with in a moment that you're thinking about where were you? The second thing is um, what happened first? what happened next? The third thing is what happened next. The fourth thing is what happened last. And the last thing is, what did you learn? And so to tell your story, you're just answering each of those questions with one sentence each. So you have a five sentence essay that, you know, that tells your whole story um, that you can, again, keep the same or go, oh, this is, this isn't good. I'm going to toss it out. Or you can pop it and turn each one of those sentences into their own paragraph or more. Love so, it. Love it. So you did that. What do you think, Nicole? You could probably use that strategy with your students. <laughs> I can. I love that. I just, just the analogy of the popcorn itself would make my kids want to write more. Wow. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So Stephen chime in. Is this the same pivotal moment? Because we were, this was the first year that we had begun teaching at the same school mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And the, I think it was probably my third year in the classroom, I think. And it was the same type of thing where I was just doing things the way my English teachers had done them. And there wasn't a whole lot of life in it. And this just breathed a sense of like, we're doing real work. We're doing something that's authentic and not tied to a textbook or just something that's just fake or a program. Uh, I remember when I did this with my students, granted, Kayla looped with her students, and so I didn't, but I remember actually being excited to read their finished products. Like once we'd gone through this process and their final essays were just a joy to read. Oh. And I turned to Kayla's like, you, you gotta read this one. And then I'd grade the next one. I'm like, you gotta read this one too. Oh, I love it. Because well, the they have a, 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 a format. It there sounds a lot like of trading back and forth. Like, no, you read this one. <laughs> I love that. So that changed everything for you. So that workshop, so our listeners should um be welcoming professional development because you never know sometimes you go into pd and it's i call it sit and get and you just yes. sit there and get or you don't get because you don't it, it doesn't resonate with us but what i'm hearing you say is that this kind of blew the doors open for your creativity and your students creativity yes. so big pivotal moment and Nicole, what did you think about that whole thing? So I think it's great. And also the fact that you said, you know, this was just a PD that you were planning on going to. And I think that, again, is where any teacher, especially new teachers, that your, your district always provides you professional development. And what people don't understand is you can go to other professional developments. You can search out professional developments based off of your students' needs and your needs as a professional. And I think that part gets lost as well. I, I love that's a good reminder for our listeners. So let's let's hear about the book. I want to know. So this happened, this moment happened, and then you're still teaching. And you have a, a published book with Corwin. So tell yeah. me what, what would I expect if I get this book? And I'm not teaching right now, but I share with a lot of teachers. So what is the purpose of this? Why did you write it? Um, Stephen, you start off and then yeah. Kayla can chime in. So we're, throughout the years, um, we've become friends with our 
with Gretchen mm -hmm. uh, Burnaby, who led this PD so many years ago. And one day, a couple of years ago, we had just finished attending one of her developments, professional development sessions, and we were just driving home. And I am a picture book author in addition to writing professionally. And I just say, like, what if we applied this? We were just dr driving somewhere. It's like, what if we applied these same ideas to picture books? Like, picture books are accessible in just about every library in America, like school library. Um, there are classics that teachers love, and there's just a plethora of fantastic picture books out there. Like, And there's a lot of craft in them. There's a lot of thought in them. They're structured beautifully and they're super high interest. And the best part is that they don't take a lot of time. And so during this drive, we were just kind of just spitballing all these ideas. And by the end of this drive, this hour drive, I think we had like a, like the genesis of what this book came to be. And so inside this book, you're going to see 50 lessons for 50 different picture books that all kind of follow the same type of pattern. Um, where you're going to be given a quick write, um, a structure that we found from the book that students can use to write their own stories. Or um, retell the or, story. Or retell the story to practice um, summarization. Um, there's also some uh, analysis lessons to teach students how to successfully find, like, what's the theme? How can you back that up? Um throughout the throughout the story and there's also some craft lessons yeah, craft lessons and uh, reading response yeah reading response there, there's a lot there's so That's much a whole lesson plan i would have everything i need as a teacher in this mm -hmm. one place i don't have to look and mm -hmm. i could use picture books this sounds like something nicole could use with her students, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I do have <laughs> students, you know, that have difficulty writing and a lot of the information that they're able to express is orally. Mm -hmm. So with them being able to orally retell a story and orally tell us a theme or, you know, the details, that's key. And mm -hmm. to know the proper way to go about it is even better. Right. Yes, because uh, you're you're giving a structure to it. I, I taught fifth grade and I had students that couldn't read in fifth grade. And I remember I loved books and libraries and I I used picture books all the time. And the, the students didn't feel so uh, stressed because there were no words and they would just tell the story. So they just right. the page and then I had a recorder and they would just tell the story out loud and uh, read to each other and make it up. And th th it built so much confidence. I think what you're doing is giving confidence to readers that might not be as strong. Um, is that part of your purpose, Kayla? Or I was going to say, not only do we want to instill confidence in our students, but the way it's written, we hope to instill confidence in teachers because that's what yes. Gretchen's work has done for us throughout our career, through all, all her books. We've been presenters for her for almost a decade now. Um, and she's got this series of text structures from like text structures from the masters, from poetry, from fables and things like that. And so that's where we went with that. But we want to not only make it easy and tangible for teachers to access it and feel like writers themselves, but then transfer that onto their students in just quick, tangible, easy ways. And just like I walked you through the memory structure, which you can use to write a narrative for yourself, every one of these picture book authors, without even knowing that they did it, they have a, a text structure that you can follow. So like you might follow, you know, four or five steps to see, oh, okay, the, um, this is what the author did first. And so if I might ask the student to retell me the story, say, okay, well, what was the problem in the story? Well, what what did the character try to do but failed? And what and how did they resolve their problem? And so every single one has a its own text structure that you can follow. Again, like Steven said, to write your own piece or to mm -hmm. to retell the story. And there's a lot of confidence built, whether you do it orally or you do it in writing. For beginning teachers, this would be a value. Every teacher should have this understanding of this structure, this format that you're uh, presenting to us. Because beginning teachers, 
who have to teach reading and writing don't have all that skill set. So this sounds like a perfect tool for that toolbox. I mean, it doesn't replace everything, but it's a it's a whole section of teaching that we need to know more about. I'm very excited about this. I, I, I was going to say that's that's great that you are building that confidence in teachers too. I feel like a lot of teachers come in and they think teaching has to be a specific way and they're afraid to go out of their box. They're afraid right. to get a little flexible. Absolutely. And, and the then, thing about that is that when we build confidence, we build competence. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. And it sounds like fun. You were having fun correcting papers. Most teachers that are listening on the podcast would be like, oh my God, I have this <laughs> bag that I'm carrying home. But it's almost like the other thing I'm thinking of as we talk is curiosity. There's more curiosity because the same picture book could be a different narrative for different students, right? Mm -hmm. And even though it's structured, so uh, can you give us one more um, technique? Because I liked the kernel, the popped kernel. Is there another um, uh, book or something? That another, you... About another thing. So uh, should we tell them about vine of beans or pitchforks or an yeah. for I'm like, there's so yeah. many. Oh, yeah, pitchforks. So that sounds one. fun. Okay, we'll talk about pitchforks. So pitchfork. a pitchfork okay. is Gretchen's word for the fancy word in numeratio, which is basically a list, right? So mm -hmm. if I could tell you, I packed some stuff in my backpack, right? And what good teacher, Nicole, what are you going to ask me? If I'm your student, like, I don't know, I pack stuff. What stuff did you pack? Okay. <laughs> you right. had that question before. Right? Exactly. I packed my switch. Right. I packed my phone. I packed my talkies. Like I, I you know, I packed. Okay. So what's happened? Well, the listeners can't see what's happened to my hand, but yeah. I put my fingers up as I was listening. And then if you hold your hand where you lift up three fingers, your hand looks like a pitchfork. You've taken uh -huh. one thing, which is your your arm there, and you branched it off into many and I mean what we know this is a list or again the rhetorical device is called the numeratio but in oh, the fancy. <laughs> and that's what kids work works <laughs> and what we discovered as we were like searching through all of these um picture books is there are all kinds of pitchforks pitchfork nouns pitchfork verbs we even anaphora which is repeating the beginning of a phrase is often found in a pitchfork. So my students now call it a nap fork. Like oh, oh, I love it. I love it. So the awesome. engage. So the other thing is curiosity, engagement, permission to have details that are unique to each student. And you're not just for following that formula. So grade levels for this process. It sounds like adult at every any level. It's a yeah. High really, school teachers it, could use it. it really, tell about the book. Yeah, I would only let us put so many grades on the cover. <laughs> um, but okay. Okay. we only think that anybody K through twelve and beyond can do yeah. this. You've seen yeah. learners do this orally or in pictures. Um, the book says what two through eight, eight. two through eight. Um, okay. But I have a lot of high school teachers. Right, I I just went and taught high school teachers this morning in a different city, and they're the they're the ones that are like, this is perfect because we're teaching them these simple these tasks, these complex tasks using these very accessible texts that they can then turn around and apply to those. Sorry, apply to those those um, complex texts that they're being asked to read and to respond to, you know, so um, they can learn to answer questions with a text structure, with a picture book, and then go, oh, okay, we read this poem in class. Let's answer this question using that same text structure we just practiced. So, I mean, when we say it's for everybody, we mean it. Like, Yeah, because you, that's how you got on board. She yeah. did it to you. <laughs> she put you in, in the studio. She's, she's, she's got, got me on board now, too. <laughs> she's got Nicole on board. I'm on board. We're all on board. So uh, professional learning um, is a theme that's uh, tonight, like mentoring mm -hmm. and uh, using uh, what we learn, what we enjoy to share with our students. When they see the teachers happy, they're, they're going to be happy and thriving and that 
we're all interested in what they have to say. Nicolo, I do want to hear your story that's in my book. We kind of got off on this text, which we love. So you have a story in the book. You were chosen to um, share. And what's the message? Uh, the title is Gain Trust Through Sharing, Sharing with Your Students. So what's the message for our listeners in this piece that you wrote for me? So the message is relating to your students. You've got to find ground ground level with them. You know, any topic that they're interested in or something that you can share with them that they may be experiencing. Um, and just simple conversations, five, 10 minutes before class, during class, really helps build that respect and that trust with them. And without that trust, really the lesson that you teach is going to go in one ear and out the other. Um, so <clears throat> for my story, anyway, Hurricane Florence came through and, you know, our house flooded. And so we, we were moved out. We were in a FEMA camper and numerous students of mine also, you know, were um, misplaced, not misplaced. I can't, <laughs> we're homeless at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we had a lot of conversations on that, on just relating in that area and knowing that I went through something that they were going through, they were able to open up and tell me how they felt and, you know, talk about the things that they've lost and what they hope for their future. And it was really good to build that trust with them through that process, because that was a difficult time for a lot of us. And just for them to know that somebody else at the school was going through it and they could talk to somebody was really helpful for that relationship. Thanks for sharing that, Nicole. I know you lost everything and your home had to be rebuilt. And sometimes as teachers, we don't want to share all the personal things with our kids. We have to figure out what's appropriate. But certainly your story in the book and the way you've just talked about it now, kids want to know we're human too and that we are vulnerable and we have tragic things that happen. And I feel like you use that as a huge teachable moment. And our beginning teachers especially um, sometimes are guided to not share much and right. kind of just teach the curriculum and not go out of the box. So I think your story is is a powerful one for, for our listeners uh, on this podcast. So thank you. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. So I have two questions for the closing. One is I'm really curious about how you take care of yourselves or hobbies you have or what makes you happy as a human being. We don't sleep at school. So we <laughs> have other lives and our students and uh, beginning teachers need to know this. So what do you do, Kayla and Steven, separately or together that is not writing books and teaching school? <laughs> well, um... I don't, I, I almost want to piggyback off what you and Nicole were just talking about. Like it, it, as a new teacher, I wish somebody had told me that it's important to write with our kids. So like that's part of that sharing and being vulnerable. So I made it a point to be a reader and a writer outside of the classroom and found that that, um, and inside my classroom, but I found that that is restorative to me. Like I, I love listening to audiobooks. I love sharing books with people being part of book clubs I also every week make sure I spend some time watercoloring um, because that just brings me so much joy. I'm not great at it, but I don't care. Um, He's good at it. Stop. <laughs> Anyways, uh... <laughs> and then as a family, we love to travel um, and national parks are our jam. We, um, I mean, so much so that my classroom is themed national park. All my tables are named after national parks. But we love to go to at least a couple every year. Um, one summer we went to 13 in, in one summer, like crazy people with our dear friends. Um, yeah. <laughs> so those are the things that I do, Stephen. Uh, well, we we'll, we'll we'll do that together. Yes. Picture book author. I'm always reading picture books. And where like it's not 
necessarily part of my teaching job. Like it is, it is a joy to me to see like what authors are doing and learning and just enjoying them period. Um, just proof that you don't have to be a kid to enjoy picture books. Yeah. And so yeah. always reading and writing, um, but yeah, national parks. I recently have become more of a basketball fan. Um, so watching basketball, especially with our daughter, I play the your team. Who do you like? To, who are you following? Rivers, they've become like okay. we've been in San yeah. Rivers, yeah. We're we're transplants in San Antonio. We've lived here for several years, but just recently we're like, okay, they're they're our team now. Like we've right. kind of become even though they've city. had an awful season. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, let's be honest. It's still your team. It's good. <laughs> Nicole, what do you do for? hobby restore just break away from the all the work we're doing <laughs> i enjoy playing the piano and i do love gardening and plants um i propagate a lot of plants okay so the inside of my house actually sort of does resemble a jungle okay what are you okay. propagating i like that I, cactus plant i saw I, I do i propagate christmas cactuses and spider plants and succulents oh, um fun. all sorts of things new life new life um one of the things i do is i i do art too kayla so i do abstract um watercolor or acrylic just patterns and colors and uh, a couple of books that I read that also use art for, for healing really and nourishing. Mary Rockwood Lane wrote a book called Healing with the Arts and it's all kinds of art and she's a PhD nurse and I gobbled that book up because it was giving me little activities much like Gretchen did to you that I could do that would make me feel good. And the other one, have you heard of Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way? Yes. Have yes. you heard that? So The Artist's Way is about having an art date with yourself and you don't need anybody else. And I, when I first read that book and I was like, I have to go somewhere by myself and do art, like a watercolor or do something. And I didn't realize how I d didn't do that. And it was so much fun. So so we all find our ways. I hope our listeners are finding and acknowledging that they do have a hobby that they that they can enjoy too. So let's do a little wrap up, a summary with uh, what Tori heard us talk about. And then I'm going to close off with uh, one of my favorite quotes. All right, Tori, what did you yeah, think? Thank you. I love this conversation. It's so fun um, kind of hearing Stephen and Kayla, first of all, talk about their book and the passion that you have uh, for the work that you're doing. It really makes makes me smile and I hope our um, listeners got got some joy out of that too. Um, Nicole, I really I heard you talking about your um, experience with a mentor that wasn't great and how that actually shaped you and that strikes me um, you know because sometimes people might want to leave the profession if they have a, a bad experience with a mentor but you instead turned it around and used that as your own sort of uh, professional learning in a way to like shape what you're going to do as an educator and as a leader. Um, and then also, you know, I, I found relationship there between Kayla and Stephen's story about um, going to Gretchen's professional development and how that really changed the way they thought about everything that they were doing in their classroom. So I appreciated that reminder to teachers to um, look for professional learning experiences. You know, if, if you're not crazy with about what you're getting in your own school, go and find something else or find another teacher who's doing exciting things because um, it's out there. And I, I'm not sure it's um, as clear to, to newer teachers what their options are. Um, also really appreciate um, the conversation about building confidence in teachers and building confidence in kids and how that leads to confidence. I think I hear that from all of you and, you know, in your work with teachers and with students. It's a really, um, I don't know, kind of energizing conversation for me. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate well, this. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm going to close with um, a quote from Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell is pretty well known for his interviews with Bill Moyer on PBS and The Power of Myth. And this kind of fits with this conversation. Follow your bliss 
and the universe will open doors for you where where there were only walls. Mm -hmm. So I hope you all keep following your bliss because this was a very energizing and positive conversation uh, for our listeners. So I'm going to thank all our listeners for listening to Teacher to Teacher. Uh, bye for now until we meet again. Thanks everyone for joining today's Teacher to Teacher conversation. We hope this time together energized you, inspired you, and reminded you why you chose to become a teacher. You can purchase any of Carol's books and any books mentioned in the podcast online at www.corwin.com. Please leave a review and share this podcast with your colleagues. Thank you for listening to the Corwin Teacher to Teacher podcast, a place to share teacher wisdom and engage in authentic conversations with experienced educators. Come explore Corwin's free new teacher toolkit and resources. We've curated these resources based on extensive research from teachers, coaches, and principals alike. Whether you are brand new or a veteran teacher, find ready-to-go teaching tools at corwin.com today.